Um, I'm interested to to learn if there's been any increases actually in in reports or um, for scams in particular just during COVID since everybody's home. But I will let Pam take the floor. Good morning. I don't, first of all, don't have a really prepared um, presentation or a PowerPoint or anything for you and hoping to be able to answer a lot of questions that you may have. Um, but just a, a brief overview is that all across the Commonwealth, the Department of Social Services is mandated to take reports of alleged abuse, neglect, or exploitation and then investigate those that are deemed to be valid according to um, the Virginia law. So um, we do that. And when we go into the homes, um, nursing homes, group homes, um, assisted living, we also at that time assess what's going on with the elder and the an elder, well, our population is anyone over 60, which again, as Jennifer was saying, 55 isn't all that old anymore and really neither is 60, but that's the um, population that we're uh, targeted to work with. In addition, we work with anyone over 18 who has any disability. And the disability is pretty, um, it's not very descript because it can be a temporary dis disability. So we work with anyone over 18, really, that has a disability or anyone just that's over 60. Um, so when we go into a home, we're generally making an unannounced visit. Uh, we have a protocol to go into the assisted livings and uh, other facilities, having to notify the administrator there. Uh, we assess what's going on with a person, see their risk, where you're charged with attempting to stop abuse, neglect, or exploitation and um, offer services. They, those are voluntary services for the person with capacity and everyone's deemed to have capacity unless adjudicated otherwise. So um, the person has the, the right and we support their right fervently to make their own decisions, although they may be bad decisions. And everyone in the community, including their family may think they're bad decisions but we have to support those if the person has capacity. And all, our entire philosophy is least restrictive, least intrusive, and trying to engage the senior in um, accepting services that, and educating them about resources. Many of the resources will be your own companies. Um, maybe getting some help in the home. We, we certainly wanna support someone in staying independent as long as possible. So when we're looking at the um, risks, we're looking at a whole lot of domains. They're physical, they're social, mental, financial, and looking at where they're falling and capacity on those. Um, because a person can have a, a lack in one area doesn't mean they have a lack in every area. But we're looking at those, all those, those things and their vulnerabilities. And the, of course, the vulnerabilities um, that a person may have make them more open to the scams, to the exploitation. Uh, some of the vulnerabilities can be um, there, a physical decline, a cognitive decline. One of the things we look at a lot is undue influence. And this can affect even the person who has capacity, where they have somebody who's in a assumed uh, position of power or authority that's um, that may have uh, the ability to to um, influence the person as they may not be on their own, but because of a threat or perceived threat that there may be something going on, a person and may end up bending their will to them. You were asking about um, scams, Angela, and if they've increased. Um, the police report that there's a lot of scams. They are not getting to us as much. What we see um, is by the time they're getting to us, either a financial institution, the person themselves, or family members are already intercepting and remedying the problems. Many of them are fraud. Um, and not exactly exploitation. The scams 
have have been going on for a very long time. The um, some of the classic ones, which you probably are familiar with, are like the grandfather grandmother or grandfather scam, where a person um, calls grandma and the, and says that they're they could be in jail in Mexico and they need five thousand dollars wired to them. Please don't tell mom. I'd be in big trouble. And grandma would say something like, "Brian, is that you?" And so now the scammer has their name. And these are some of the entries. Um, they, we realize that a lot of the, those are um, then sold to other professional criminals. Um, we've worked with a lot of them where the, one of the problems is that um, in most cases, the person is actually a voluntary, they're a victim, but they're voluntarily participating in the scams. Um, worked with some even with FBI, been in a home with FBI there and people are calling and the people are willing to continue uh, giving tremendous amounts of money. One in particular I recall working was a woman who was, um, her husband was um, vice president of a major corporation. Uh, they were very well invested. She started with that, the, the grandfather scheme and then uh, it just escalated. It was sold, we learned later, to um, two companies. Uh, well, one was in Jamaica and also one was in Russia. It was Russian mafia. And so th they are not able to be prosecuted. They're not here. Our law enforcement can't go after them. Um, so it ends up really often in sad situations where, where our role is educating people um, to change their phone numbers, um, to not answer the phone. But I, I bet every one of you have had a call one, or email about that you've won this wonderful sweepstakes. And it is amazing how many people will actually respond to that and give sensitive information. Um, so these professionals have shifted some, some of their um, tactics. And early on in COVID, they were offering COVID um, vaccinations, all you have to do is give us your information, your social security number and, the, and your phone number and all this stuff. So then they would get access to things. Um, we find that they're very sophisticated in how they uh, get, get the information, but it's still, it's given voluntarily by the unsuspecting person, not always an elder. I mean, we're seeing it right across the board where people are losing just unbelievable amounts of money, their life savings. Um, one of the things that we see with the exploitation is that people who have been victim of that um, have a much earlier mortality. That's really kind of concerning because they've experienced such a trauma, you know, and they often don't want to report it to any authority or to their family because then they can be perceived as not being able to handle things, you know, or maybe think then maybe their daughter's going to come in and start taking over or like wanting to monitor their checkbook or things. So it's, um, there's a lot of reluctance to report. Even um, in pretty significant exploitations, we, we're believing that it's probably less than 40% that are actually reported. Um, so interesting is that um, of the reports we get, probably the most of them come from the people themselves or family. The very second place we would get them from is financial institutions. And although the um, people in financial institutions are not mandated reporters, although I imagine that most of you are being licensed, um, the financial institutions have, there's more and more legislation to protect them. And so they are, um, not only reporting, but cooperating as any mandated reporter is required to. One um, thing that we run into lots is that the person who's a mandated reporter is required, excuse me. The person who's a mandated reporter is required to provide any and all um, information that may be pertinent to an investigation, whether or not they're the reporter. And that's something that kind of goes against the grain for many of us because we're, we're so used to confidentiality and HIPAA and not, not, um, not giving out any information for any of our customers. But if um, an APS 
investigation is in place and an APS uh, worker requests the information that's pertinent, any mandated recorder is required by Virginia law and using the strongest language of shall produce any information required. Um, I always like to let people know that because I, I don't think it's well known. In fact, um, there's usually so much resistance to it, even in doctor's offices, that I actually carry the, the law with me. So when we go out. I so, think that Graham might have had a question or a comment. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, it was a bit of a story. One of my colleagues, his, his mother, who is an elder, received a call purportedly from her granddaughter asking for money for a car. What was incredible was that the, the scammer had technology to mimic the granddaughter's voice. Wow. So saying, hey, I'm Adriel. It really sounded like Adriel. And the reason that the grandmother was able to figure it out was because she knew her, her daughter lived in D.C., as the scammer knew, uh, but her granddaughter did not have a car. So the scam to ask for money for a car was not plausible to the grandma. But in every other way, it was possible, including that the voice sounded exactly like her granddaughter. Just, just so you know, it's it's not just like the Nigerian prince email. Uh, it's really sophisticated. Yeah, it is. In fact, um, in a couple of cases, we've seen that when we've asked people to or suggested that they change their phone number, the, the professionals were sophisticated enough to make it look like they, that it was CenturyLink on the phone with them. I mean, it came across their screen as CenturyLink and they changed their number to a different one that gave the scammer access. Some of the other classic techniques they'll do is once they've got a victim and, and they're getting people to go and get gift cards, green dot cards, all kinds of things. Um, when we get really concerned is when there's things where they're showing up in person or getting a neighbor to, because they can, you know, look at the map around, find someone's name and get that person to go over to the house and say, you've got a call because your aunt's really sick. And then they've got them again. Um, this one woman that I was talking about that had um, started on that scam with, over a few year period, um, she squandered her entire resources to the point where her lights were not able to be on. Um, finally, her family stepped in. Um, they were very reluctant to because she was a very strong, independent person. But they, the family was the only one that could actually stop it at that point. Um, and it, it is not isolated at all. Um, many of the ones that we see are also the sweetheart scams where someone is believing that they've got the affection of someone. And these are often a long game where um, there's little bits of money, gifts may be given. And then the person goes like, well, I'm over here in this country or I mean, just they start with really amazing stories that it seems like any logical person would see right through, but they're lonely. Um, and we find as in the vulnerability factors, um, that is one of them, the loneliness. Um, the, the people that are targeted most are women um, and they're uh, often recently widowed, which the professionals can find out. You know, they're wanting someone to talk to, somebody to give them advice and there's many people. This is of concern, I'm sure, for you, for you professionals that are in these industries because the trust factor has to be there and um, it becomes difficult and to be able to do that. Your reputations are so important and your ethical behavior at all times in and out is so important. Anybody have any questions about anything here yet? Pam, I have a question. Um, sure. How easy or how often is it that the victims can get their funds back? Oh, what that is one of the things that we're quite hopeful because we're seeing, in, you know, when they're working with their financial, uh, their institution, they're, um, and making police reports, following their protocol, they are very likely to get money back. But when it's a scam that they're, you know, sending money to, uh, uh, Pennsylvania because they're with the hope of getting some money back from this, it almost becomes a Ponzi scheme. 
there's no money coming back. But it, when it's through the banks and um, credit unions and the, the, the financial institutions, there, there's great likelihood they're going to get the, their money back. Um, you know, we see that it's often caregivers. Um, the, the majority of scams or exploitation actually comes from family members. And it's not always the wealthy. Um, it could be for um, grandma's $700 social security check. Um, but over the past years, I think that I see more, um, more prevalence as, I don't know, as just a, a moral, I'm not getting in a soapbox, but a moral decline in society where it used to be considered you would protect and honor your elders. And, and that's, that's really not the case anymore, unfortunately. We do see that differently though in different cultures. For instance, in the Hispanic culture, there continues to be that, what I would call an old fashioned, probably pre, pre, um, pre-war um, philosophy. Pam? Yeah. Um, Kathy's got a question. Her mic's not working too well, so she put it in the chat, but she said, can you expand on who mandated reporters are? Yeah, and it's anyone who carries a, a license. Um, the, so um, they can be in, in healthcare, in uh, working with the families. Uh, I probably have a paper here on actually who is the mandated reporter. And I'd be happy to send out some stuff on this because I'm, my guess is that probably all of you are. Um, the only ones who are not are, um, are the financial. And um, I, think, I think veterinarians I may not be. Um, let's see. Any person who is licensed, certified, or registered by health regulatory boards um, with, with the exception of veterinarians, anyone who provides any mental health services, any medical, uh, emergency medical personnel reporting to the Board of Health, personnel immediately reporting to, must immediately report to sus suspected abuse, neglect, or exploitation, um, any guardian or conservator, any person employed by or contracted with a public services private agency or facility, and working with adults in an administrative supportive or direct care capacity. That's the one that probably fits most of you, I would guess. Um, who are contracted with any private or public agency that's working with adults. Any person providing full intermittent or occasional care to an adult for compensation, including but not limited to companion, chore, homemaker, or personal care workers and any law enforcement officer. So those are mandated reporters. Um, we um, try to get out into the community, although we have not been much lately, and put on a, a presentation about mandated reporting for, so people can know about it. And you can ask us to come. We would be happy to come to, if, to um, speak to any of your staff about their responsibilities. Now, um, there's different entities, for instance, like uh, a nursing home or a community services board that can have their own protocol of how their uh, staff can report because they may want it to go through someone, but they cannot prevent it. And each person that's hired is responsible as they, they are a mandated reporter. Graham, um, did you have something? Yeah, I was going to say uh, we we are a franchise of Ameriprise Financial, and within Ameriprise, there's mandatory reporting for people who are fiduciaries, right? Because you're mm -hmm. acting with the client. It is not a, a mandatory reporting to the state, but it is a mandatory reporting to Ameriprise for them to investigate and protect the interest of someone who may be at risk. We've seen that a number of times over the past year. Ameriprise is doing a great job of it. I assume our peer institutions are doing the same. Because it's a huge risk to them, right? If they're yeah. exploited and the frontline fiduciaries are not paying attention. Yeah, we are seeing a, a much greater participation by the financial in institutions. Um, 
prior to this, I think there was kind of a, um, uh, an attitude that we, we need to protect our customers. So we're not gonna let somebody investigate this, somebody outside. And now they're really realizing that this is the best protection for their customer is to, to get people involved that, are, uh, that, that have the ability to. In APS, we have a unique ability to be able to request records that even the police can't get while there's an open investigation. So uh, we take that very, very seriously. Um, let's see, where to say. Uh, just a couple of years ago, with um, we have here in the area, we have the, Jeff the Thomas Jefferson Area Coalition to End Elder Abuse. And there's quite a few people in, in the community that sit on that being attorneys and uh, not only local, but state, uh, federal, different um, different companies here. And uh, our previous Commonwealth attorney in, in Albemarle had run on a platform of protecting the elders and prosecu prosecuting wherever possible. Um, with that, we had our, our other senior worker who sat on the board and one of our detectives were able to initiate some legislation that really helped out these uh, financial institutions where it removed some of the liability that they would have. If what, what, The reason that we needed it was sometimes we're seeing a place where there's a, an elder is just bleeding out financially. We're aware of the situation and some of the banks were not willing to, um, to freeze the funds because of things that would happen because of that and their liability. And now they're, um, it was done, um, a year ago, July, I believe. I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the bill, but it removed the liability from these institutions and increased their ability to cooperate and report. Anything else? Oh, yeah, I, have a, I have another question, Pamela. Sure. Um, can, can you speak to elder elder abuse? And we've been yeah. speaking about the scams and things, but. Could you talk a little more about abuse? Well, we of all the types of um, of things that we investigate, abuse, neglect, and exploitation, the greatest of those is in is in abuse, but it's not abuse by others. It's self abuse or self neglect, and this happens as the as a person um, goes through aging process changes. Maybe they're becoming more isolated. Maybe they're not taking their medications. Um, maybe they're not getting to doctors or getting food. You know, especially when we have these kind of weather events, we're, we've been like on high alert here going out to, because there's a lot of people still without power. I went to one home yesterday that have been without power for since Monday. And we were trying to brainstorm about, they didn't want to leave. They had the right to not leave. I just wanted to make sure they had enough covers, blankets, and something to eat because some of one of the um, things that a lot of people rely on is the Meals on Wheels. Of course, they weren't running because of the weather. So this friendly visitor who would show up every day um, wasn't there. Um, and so we were able to find peanut butter and four pieces of bread. And I offered to go out and help them get some more things. They didn't did not want those. Um, so that that is often the profile of the person they're not wanting. I was just a statistic on this is that uh, in across the state of of annually about thirty some thousand reports that come in. Probably 27, 20 some of those are investigated, and. Of people that accept services is probably down as low as like 400,000 out of those. So, um, because it's a voluntary program. I know many people are frustrated because they go, APS isn't doing anything, um, but we have to go by the, what the person wants to do. We try to be really influential. Abuse, um, physical abuse, we, we honestly don't see an awful lot of that. Um, we, we have, of course, but most of the abuse that we would investigate by others would fall under um, a mental abuse. 
and uh, demeaning the person. And well, the thing of it is, is that no abuse is isolated. We find that there's one or two always going on together. Whether if there's a, a mental abuse, a financial abuse may be happening. Um, so some of the things are subtle that are being done, um, like in the mental abuses, like if you don't do this, then you're gonna be going to a nursing home and um, threatening a person who wants to stay home. Other questions? So when you have someone who is self-neglecting and you can't force them to do anything, then is there a point at which it becomes involuntary? Well, it, it's the capacity question. That's the thing that separates us from child protective services is the child is, is vulnerable. And so there's much more legal intervention. But capacity is the thing that, that drives everything that we do. Um, the adult with capacity has the right to make bad decisions. When we question the capacity, we do try to get an evaluation uh, for them. Um, and then yes, then we move into higher legal uh, possibilities. So some of you have been working with people to get power of attorney. That's just one of the things that we really encourage people to do early on. Now, I think it's since 2012, all, all power of attorneys in Virginia are um, durable, meaning that they last even when the person lacks capacity. And those are what we would prefer to work with. Um, the rather than going to a higher level of substitute decision-making. Um, many people have advanced directives and we can help uh, we look for the support system, be it family, friends, um, sometimes their community, um, for people that can help support them. When we, we do have legal um, avenues that we pursue after those are exhausted and the person doesn't have capacity, Specifically, we look at um, conservatorship and guardianship. I um, manage the guardianship oversight for everyone in Albemarle County who has a guardian who are either over 80 or elderly. Right currently, we have about two, 237 people that are under guardianship. Um, the local uh, Department of Social Services is mandated to, to take and review reports annual reports of guardians, an initial report for the first four months, and then an annual report. And these are um, just seven very brief questions as to what's going on with the person physically, mentally, socially, and what the care they're getting and if it's adequate. It's not a lot of oversight, but if we don't get the reports, um, then we have the ability to initiate an APS investigation and go out and actually see the people and see what's going on. In the cases where we've had to do that, what we often find is that the guardian is, um, maybe grandpa and grandma were guardians for a, a child or a 18 year old, a younger person. And um, grandpa died and grandma didn't know that they, she needed to make the report. We often find that the guardian is not able to do it anymore. And then we have to get a substitute guardian. We the guardianship is the, you know, the most restrictive and our last resort, but um, we do use legal means if we have to. Um, we, we work with the police a lot in, um, you know, if we need to do welfare checks and see if somebody needs to have uh, potentially an emergency custody order um, just for evaluation. And um, that's not something that's that's lasting, you know, they just have to go in to be evaluated. And that's mostly in the case of mental health issues. We do see an incredible rise in the cases of uh, the mental health issues, as well as dementia. Um, you know, as the population is growing, we're really not equipped to, to deal with in the community. Uh, we're really not equipped to do that, to deal with that. What we would mostly hope to do is get supports in the home. I know um, we've certainly worked a lot with your group, Kim, um, in, in getting um, some emergency services in even for a short time. 
um, or hopefully for a longer period of time. Um, and I, I really wish that there were more, more companies that were able to uh, staff in home care for people because that probably is the best solution for most people. Some people really thrive in the assisted livings and other facilities and they enjoy them with the, with the company. It's not the answer for everyone. But when you look at all the whole continuum of possibilities for the person, like this one person that I went out with yesterday, um, I'm checking back with them today to make to see that they're, if their power's on, if they have food, Next week, I'll be going back out there to see if we can help get some help in the home because they clearly need some help and they they realize that they're not okay, but didn't know how to reach out or what's available. Some of the other services that we have here are um, companion services program, which is one of the only preemptive kind of things that's available. Um, and unfortunately, we're not able to manage a very large group. Um, I think currently we have 18 people that are on the companion services program and it's an income-based program. We also take requests for screenings for assisted living and for nursing home placement. We have one person who's dedicated to doing that um, and one person who works with a companion program. There's four investigators for all the, of Albemarle County. Um, and we take probably uh, between 30 and 70 reports a month on APS investigation lasts 45 days. So there's an overlap of time. An investigator may have between four and eight new cases each month. So um, we certainly depend on, on community partners and we, we know that no, no one entity can solve these solutions and it, it does take a community. And I really am excited about organizations like this that network to um, make resources known. We certainly don't know all the resources and um, it, make yourselves known in the community. I know you're doing that with this group. Um, but we really need the help of everyone. I don't remember what your question was, but I don't know if I answered it. <laughs> <laughs> huh. All right, anybody else have any questions? I've got a little something to say before everyone goes, if, if we're done. I just but wanna I say, I'm really sorry I had connective issues here, but I'm, I'm here now. <laughs> Thank you, Pam, for coming. Yeah. Really appreciate it. It so, was a wonderful presentation and very informative. Thank you so much. Okay. And if you want us to come out and talk to your groups about mandated reporting, we're happy to do that.